unless you were very rich and you could have somebody paint a painting or do a tapestry, what you would do is you would go out and buy a print and that would have photorealistic color on it. And that was done with chromolithography. Hello, this is Shoshana Burgett from Color Karma. I am here in Haverhill, uh, Massachusetts with Frank Romano, president of Museum of Printing. Thank you so very much. Thank you for coming. So we are talking about chromolithography and um, it's an early form of color printing, like the first form of color printing. It goes back, if you trace it back to its roots, uh, in 1790, a composer wanted a way to reproduce his music. And the problem with music is that the lines and the notes overlap. So there was no way to use metal type to do that. He happened to live in the one place in the world, Bavaria, where there was a form of limestone that was very porous. And through his experiments, he came up with the process called lithography. Lithos for stone, graphy for writing, stone writing. And that became a way of reproducing images. Anything you could draw on the stone could be reproduced. Okay, first of all, the stone is completely flat. It's a form of porous limestone. And anything you draw on here with ink will adhere to the surface, not embed in the surface, and can be reproduced. And the way that would happen is after the ink dried, you would coat it with water and gum arabic, and then take a roller with ink on it. And as you rolled it across, the ink would only adhere to the image area. And then when you put a piece of paper in pressure, you could transfer the image onto the paper. That's what lithography is. And so many books would have text that was done with metal type, and they would have other pages that were printed separately with lithography, and that's how you had images in books. Around 1860 or so, they discovered that they could use multiple stones and overlap colors and therefore create what we now know as full color. It could take six to almost 40 stones to get what they wanted. So 40 individual colors or tints. That is correct. The problem is we have one stone out there that's a one color of a Curry and Ives print, and, and that's about four feet by three feet. Well, that weighs a ton. Now, it would have looked like that. It would have been a fruit bowl of some sort. And we've discovered that they did 20 or 30 different variations on that. And uh, we're not quite certain which one that is. We're, we're trying to analyze it right now. But as you can see, it involved grapes. It involved various kinds of fruit. Um, and that was, again, one color. So you would have had 10 stones or more to do that particular poster down there. So the odds are, if you had anything bigger than that, they would have multiple stones to do that. So you'd have you know, do the top part of the poster and then the bottom part of the poster or something like that. Korean Ives perfected the process and that was the only art that people had on their walls for many years. Got it. Wow. They had it down to a science. So it would take them nine months to create the art and produce 1,000 pieces. Now, they weren't really full color because it wasn't cyan, magenta, yellow, black with the inks overlapped and intermingled. This is a case where each ink was on top of one another. And so they used it then for special purposes for reproducing um, cigar box labels, for reproducing uh, pictures of animals and people. And a lot of these were used as images that you could cut out and paste in an album. They were called scraps. And by the time you get to the Victorian era, Victorian scrap collecting was a big thing. So these are some of the largest scraps that we found. And they're, they're fascinating because as you can see, it's not CMYK. So they had to use various tints in order to get the skin tones and then to put the blush and the lipstick in, and then to get the color of the hair and the red over here, and then the different color for this necklace. Um, and, and, and the, the gloves that are on, and then the dress. So you can see how many different colors were involved. And again, this would then be die cut, and you can see that that was also embossed and then coated, and you have a beautiful piece of art, and this would go in a scrapbook, 
and these scrapbooks would just say scraps on them. And it started to be used for promotional purposes, for promotional cards, for d direct mail pieces or whatever. So this is how they would die cut them. You would have the, the, the die and then you would press the paper under pressure and then it would cut it out. This was a, for embossing, you would have a shape of some sort and you would then force it against the shape in some way. Um, and this is a book, by the way, that shows many of the different shapes that you could get from the die cutting um, or the embossing. In fact, if you feel some of these, you can actually feel the embossed edges around the sides of it. Um, so there was a whole system here from creating it, painting it, I'm sorry, painting it on the stones, reproducing it, then going through the various processes of, of embossing, die cutting, um, varnishing, um, and then selling them. And so these would be sell, sold in little kits and people would collect them. However, in 1900, they discover offset lithography. And by 1910 or so, a, an ink company in Philadelphia finally gets the formulation for CMYK inks proper. And now you have the ability through halftone dots, which were invented in 1890, to create the illusion of full color, photorealistic color. So it all began with chromolithography to produce color. <laughs>